I hope that you all enjoyed afternoon tea and your recent breakout sessions, and thank you for coming back across for our final plenary of this afternoon. We do have bookmarks for the National Strategy at the Information and Wellbeing Desk for anyone who does want a quick QR code to go directly to the brand new National Strategy for Volunteering. Our plenary this afternoon is all about reimagining re volunteering across the ecosystem. We are going to start with a keynote address from the Honourable Amanda Rishworth, MP, Minister for Social Services, and then move straight into a panel discussion afterwards. They'll be invited to answer some key questions, our panellists, but then we will go to audience Q&A, uh, and this time we'll actually get through some questions, hopefully, uh, and we'll use Slido again, but also have the roving mics in the room. And just in the interest of time, a friendly reminder to keep comments to one sentence, please, uh, questions to one sentence. Now, unfortunately, Minister Rishworth is actually stuck at Parliament House, so she was unable to be here in person and has sent her apologies. And she has actually also sent an address uh, via video to welcome us here. So we'll play that video for you now and then get stuck into the panel. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land which I'm recording this speech today, the Ngunnawal people. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia and the lands from which you're joining us today, particularly those conference participants dialing into this session from around the country. I'm proud to be part of a government that is committed to be delivering a voice to parliament. I'd like to acknowledge today's panellists Thank you for the work you do in your respective roles to support our volunteering community. Volunteers are the backbone of our communities. They give up their time to better society and improve the lives of those in the communities they serve. It's always incredibly rewarding presenting volunteer awards in my community and I've spent many hours volunteering myself as a surf lifesaver. The spirit of volunteering is central to the fabric of Australia. To the panellists today, I know that you each come with different perspectives of the volunteering ecosystem and bring significant expertise to this discussion from a wide range of volunteering organisations. I am sorry I can't be with you there in person today. Unfortunately, Parliament is sitting in Canberra and I've not been able to leave the building. It's great to hear that almost a thousand people are joining today's conference, both in person and online. This level of support displays the energy and dedication of the very types of people who come forward to donate their time, effort and skills to good causes and people who need a hand through volunteering. As well, we all come together to launch Australia's first Australian strategy for volunteering in 10 years. Our nation's future will depend so much on the strength of our volunteering community. It's in the title of the conference, The Future Is Now. It's a stark contrast to the first National Volunteering Conference, which was first held almost 40 years ago in 1985. The title of that first conference was Volunteering, What Is It? In contrast, this year's conference, which focuses on the future of volunteering, captures perfectly the desire we share to drive forward a vision of a thriving volunteering community. Volunteers not only directly help those in need or are vulnerable in our communities, volunteering also contributes a more intangible, powerful force that builds community connections between individuals and the social fabric that make Australian society what it is, making it inclusive, diverse and strong. Let me now turn to the panel discussion that will follow my introductory remarks. The topic of this session is reimagining volunteering across the ecosystem, learning from and collaborating with each other. This could not be a more appropriate uh, session in light of the new national strategy for volunteering launched today, as it captures the very essence at the heart of this strategy. It's acknowledging the diversity and complexity of the volunteering landscape. 
It recognises the assortment and variety in the stakeholders that make up the volunteering community, ranging from individuals themselves, state and territories and national peak bodies, volunteering support services, community organisations, philanthropic organisations, as well as all levels of government and the business community. In spite of the challenges of coordinating such a diverse array of voices and perspectives, we are all intent on maximising the collective impact of volunteering. It's from this diversity that we're able to find strength by learning from our different perspectives, from the unique challenges we encounter and the innovative ways we've developed to tackle and solve these challenges. And it's these insights that we take from each other's experiences that allow us to work together and to collaborate to achieve the vision of the new National Volunteering Strategy. I'm grateful for the work that's been done by Volunteering Australia to coordinate and drive forward the 12-month co-design process that has resulted in this excellent strategy document. This process included a consultative discovery phase to build the evidence base to inform the thinking. It included face-to-face -face visioning sessions and a building phase with opportunities to test and refine the framework, as well as obtain feedback on drafts. The launch of the National Volunteering Strategy is a crucial milestone towards reimagining the future of the volunteering sector in this country. The Albanese Labor government is keen to support initiatives like this that set up the right foundations for the type of country we all want to live in, one that helps lift those who are most disadvantaged or at risk in our society and puts in place mechanisms that encourages and supports others who choose to volunteer. One part of the volunteering landscape I want to address first is the Volunteer Management Activity Programme. The Volunteer Management Activity Program is aimed at helping the sector, many of you here at today's conference, to recruit, train and manage more staff to meet their volunteering roles. The purpose of the Volunteer Management Activity is to increase opportunities for people to participate in the social and economic life of their broader community through volunteering, by building effective volunteering practices and opportunities within organisations and communities, increasing the diversity of volunteers, improving access to information on volunteering, providing access to training, resources and support volunteers and volunteering involved organisations need. It's a good program, but we know the reality is that it hasn't worked well for all parts of the sector. The volunteering management activity was independently reviewed under the previous government, but the implementation of the reformed volunteer management activity had some unintended consequences. One of the first activities I did was sign off on the, in this space last December to address some of these issues. These challenges included, or these changes included expanding the eligible priority groups to unemployed Australians, young people aged 12 to 18, and vulnerable fit women facing disadvantage or at risk of being socially isolated. I also moved to increase the transparency of the funding distributed through peak bodies who will be required to provide timely reporting on who and where funding has been distributed within their jurisdictions. And I'm pleased to announce today I've also allocated an additional $4 million over two years from 2022-23 to provide targeted funding for volunteering resource centres to address concerns that have been raised by the sector about their immediate viability. This funding will be made available to 37 VRCs in grants of $50,000 per year. This will provide organisations that deliver or have previously delivered Commonwealth funded volunteer management activity services time to review their services and work with their peak bodies to align with the volunteer management activity jurisdictional implementation plans. 
While some VRCs have transitioned well, others have struggled, and we want to provide the time and support to adapt as we work through the new model. The new model focuses on supporting volunteer involving organisations to effectively recruit, train, support and retain volunteers and to break down barriers to volunteering. Shortly, my department will be inviting volunteer, uh, volunteer resource centres that had previously delivered volunteer management activity to apply for the additional capacity building funding. I want to stress that this is a very important step made by the Albanese Labor government to ensure this new model works and to fix the problems left behind by the previous government. Place-based services are critical to the success of the redesigned volunteer management activity and volunteering more broadly and in the long term. Volunteer management activity will be dependent upon the VRCs and the peak bodies working cooperatively together to provide services at both statewide and local levels. I know my department will continue to support the state and territory volunteer peaks and the volunteer resource centres to work together to achieve the outcomes we all want to achieve in this space. And I'd welcome your support and collaboration to continue to do this. Volunteers not only provide care and support to some of our most vulnerable members of the community, but are also front and centre when disasters strike, working tirelessly to keep our communities safe and together. They are often at the end of the phone, ready and willing to listen and support people in moments of great crisis. They help to build the skills and capabilities of others, like for example, through the Be Connected program, that supports older Australians to improve their digital skills and confidence when they're faced with often intimidating new digital technologies. Volunteers also support children and young people to thrive through community sport, reading programs and other mentoring and social programs. There are just endless examples of the diverse activities that volunteers deliver in our communities. Similarly, there are endless reasons for why people volunteer. Volunteering can help people be part of a community, providing the opportunity to meet new people, create a sense of belonging at the same time as an opportunity to learn something new. Volunteering is also personally rewarding, allowing individuals to share their experiences and talents and creating a sense of personal achievement and purpose. Despite these enormous benefits to both the community and volunteers themselves, I don't need to point out to many of you, given your collective expertise, that there is an alarming rate of decline in volunteering in the last decade and there's an overwhelming need for more people to come forward. Last year's Volunteering in Australia survey captured just how high demand it is for volunteers, telling us that 83% of organisations surveyed reported they needed more volunteers immediately or in the near future. The National Volunteering Strategy addresses this need by tapping into some of the fundamental drivers of why people choose to volunteer and the conditions that make it possible. I'm pleased to say that I believe the new National Volunteering Strategy does a great job at addressing the key pillars that will influence the factors around volunteering numbers. The National Strategy does this by providing a blueprint for the way forward to achieve the outcomes that will add up to creating a vision for volunteering and its development over the next 10 years. It, are, it is underpinned by three key focus areas, the volunteer, the community and the conditions for volunteering. These three focus areas are informed by some key objectives that run consistently throughout the strategy. These objectives include, firstly, making volunteering inclusive and accessible to everyone. Second, ensuring Australians understand and value volunteering. Third, 
recognising that communities will be the primary driver of volunteering. And fourth, recognising that volunteering is advanced through the common agenda that is underpinned by genuine collaboration. I hope that you agree with me that these are the right objectives to underpin a 10 year national strategy. Now that the strategy itself is completed, the next phase of this body of work will involve the development of a three year action plan. This activity will include governance, monitoring and evaluation, and most importantly, an agreed implementation model that ensures shared accountability for achieving our vision across all key stakeholders. I'd like to acknowledge the extensive work undertaken by Volunteering Australia on the National Strategy for Volunteering and thank Mark Pierce and the team for this great outcome that we're launching today. In that regard, I'm pleased to announce today that just last week I signed off on a grant of $367,000 to Volunteering Australia to implement the National Volunteering Strategy. I want to see the efforts of volunteers celebrated every day. But of course, National Volunteering Week is a particular moment to stop and recognise the sector. So I'm also pleased to announce a grant of $240,000 over the next three years to Volunteering Australia to fund the National Volunteer Week 2023, 2024 and 2025. These are grants that will make a real difference to our volunteering ecosystem. I want to thank Volunteering Australia for its support to deliver the National Volunteering Strategy. Volunteering is part, as I've said, of the fabric of our society and it benefits all of us. The launch of the National Strategy for Volunteering is only the beginning of the conversation. I look forward to hearing your thoughts from the discussion today and look forward to working with you in your local communities. Your contributions are recognised, valued and celebrated. Thank you. I would now like to invite Mark Pearce, CEO of Volunteering Australia, to introduce our next panel and our panellists to come up onto the stage. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, despite not being able to uh, attend here today because of restrictions at Parliament House, we appreciate the Minister making time to address the, uh, the audience today. Uh, Volunteering Australia would like to thank the department for its ongoing support for volunteering across the country. Um, and we certainly look forward to continuing the relationship that we have with the department and moving forward into this next phase of the national strategy for volunteering. I should uh, just note, um, always risky to, uh, to to check a minister, but um, it, the the funding isn't actually for implementation, it's for the establishment phase. I think we all know it's going to take a lot more than $360,000 <laughs> to implement this national strategy. Um, perhaps an addition of an additional zero <laughs> might uh, might come close. Um, but um, certainly we, uh, we appreciate the ongoing uh, support. Our panel, is made up of household names in the charity sector, fierce advocates who have a unique understanding of the role charities play in community, of how individuals interact with charities themselves and how they get involved in the communities to which they service. I'd like to introduce my panelists for this particular session. Cameron French, to my immediate left is the Deputy General Manager of Participation at the Australian Sports Commission. Cameron has over 20 years of experience in the sporting industry in both paid and unpaid roles. In his day job, Cameron is tasked with overseeing the efforts to boost participation in sports across Australia. And in his spare time, he's a volunteer coach. 
I think my second job's harder than my first job, Mark, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> point, point taken. <laughs> Camilla Rowland is the CEO of Palliative Care Australia. Camilla has worked in health and community services for over 30 years, including 16 years based in rural Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. In her spare time, Camilla volunteers her time in various board roles in the health and community sectors. Brianna Casey is the CEO of Food Bank Australia. Brianna's career has centred on her love of social policy and advocacy and her passion for storytelling. I can attest to the storytelling <laughs> piece. Uh, Brianna is one of our wonderful sport volunteers as the manager of an under 18s National Premier League soccer team. Also a hard gig. Also a hard gig. <laughs> Our final panelist is Mohammed Al Khafaji, and he is the CEO of the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils of Australia, also known to many of you as FECA. Mo came to Australia in 2003 as an Iraqi refugee, so he can attest firsthand to the need for organisations like FECA, which support people from multicultural communities. Camilla, Brianna, Mo and Cam were all members of the National Strategy for Volunteering Council. Um, Cam, you might not have been on the council itself, but certainly the ASC was represented. You were. Uh, providing oversight and strategic guidance to this project to which we've been speaking today. Please join me in giving them a warm welcome. So, questions to the panel, and I have some I prepared earlier. Our first question is about cross-sector learning and collaboration. Brianna, through COVID, cross-industry collaboration was integral to keeping Food Bank running. Why is cross-sector learning and collaboration important to reinvigorating volunteering? For so many reasons. First and foremost, um, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Nanawal people land uh, and pay my respects to Elders Past, Present and Emerging. And I want to give some context for why this is an important question for Food Bank. Tonight, half a million households are going to struggle to put a meal on the table. 1.3 million children live in homes where mum and dad are struggling to put a meal on the table for them. And for us, when our ability to get food relief into our community is compromised, that has a real impact on the most vulnerable people in our communities. So what we rely on incredibly heavily is a network of volunteers, a network of food and grocery donors to ensure that we can source and distribute healthy, nutritious food to those who need it when they need it. And what we saw throughout COVID was disruption not only in our ability to source food and groceries, but more importantly, to pick, pack, sort and transport those groceries. And if we look at how many volunteer days are needed at Food Bank, 37,500 volunteer days in the last year. If I had to look at even just minimum wage to hire <coughs> people to replace our volunteers, it would cost in excess of $5.6 million. We can turn every dollar into two meals. That's 11 million meals that I wouldn't be able to get into the food bank network. And we distribute 88 million meals a year. So when COVID struck, we had to think really laterally about how we could replace those essential volunteers in every state and territory food bank across the country. There was incredible innovation. I know Luke Chesworth's here from Food Bank New South Wales and ACT. He turned to the Australian Defence Force. He turned to those in our community who could step in and assist us when we couldn't have our regular corporate or employee, employer volunteers, as well as our regular community volunteers. We reached out to different distribution networks. Traditionally, we worked through a network of 3,000 charities nationally. Many of you are in the room today. Uh, and we had to look at communities that we didn't traditionally go into. We worked closely with the Country Women's Association. We reached out to groups like FECA, like the, the group sitting around us today, to find alternate avenues to tap in and share resources when they were scarce. And everything that we do at Food Bank is built around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And number 17, Partnerships for the Goals, is no different. We can't do what we do without solid partnerships. We can't do what we do with volunteering without the generous support of Corporate Australia, 
without the generous support of our community, without leaning on our colleagues in the sector when we are all struggling and recognising that when we share ideas, when we are conducting peer-to-peer -peer learning, we are so much richer as a sector. So I love that the strategy is not only putting that up as best practice, but really laying out a path for us all to work together and have greater impact. Here, here. Thanks, Brianna. Camilla, as someone with very extensive experience working in the challenging multidisciplinary environment that is health, how do we ensure that we establish an ongoing dialogue between organisations within a sector and across sectors? in the volunteering ecosystem? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things here and having been involved in volunteering pretty much all my life, uh, but mostly in the health and community sector, everything is interconnected in Australia. This is not just a volunteering ecosystem, it's all interconnected with our whole society and our whole Australian infrastructure. So health interconnects with justice, interconnects with community sector, interconnects with education. So cross portfolio mechanisms are really important to think about in terms of the mm. volunteering ecosystem. So the second thing is, is that we have a lot to learn in health about what's happened overseas and around their volunteering. So we're a global society. We're not just Australia. We do have great Australians who have incredible programs. We're community oriented. And the previous panel said, you know, everything should be community led. That's not too, dis too dissimilar to most Western countries in the world. What we have learned is that health is mostly multidisciplinary. We're not a medical model society. We're a, we're a multidisciplinary society and volunteers just aren't in hospitals. And if you remember pink ladies from 40 years ago, we're not just a bunch of pink ladies. You know, we have mental health um, volunteers and personal helpers and mentors, uh, volunteers in dementia care. We have volunteers in palliative care. Palliative care volunteers have been going for over 30 years and they're not a separate ecosystem. They are part of the palliative care multidisciplinary team. They are included in the team meetings. They are allocated to working with particular patients or consumers and families and they follow them through the journey. So then we have cancer care volunteers. Well, at the moment, everything is in silos. So how can we as multidisciplinary team health sectors actually work more closely together? And that's actually really about having in place mechanisms such as task force and um, forums where the national peak bodies and the national major providers actually get together to look at how we can improve and build on what's happened since COVID. Because if you think about it in, in during COVID, Health was you were either an essential service or you weren't an essential service. And if you weren't considered essential, and there were pretty strong guidelines around this, and mostly those volunteers stopped working. And therefore we know that as, as Amanda Rishworth said, over 83% of organisations are looking for volunteers. And if you look deeper into that strategy, a significant part of that is we have volunteers missing in the health sector. So, you know, I would say this is almost a crisis point because our health costs are just going to go up if we don't put in place volunteers to help support that whole health ecosystem. Uh, so this is a whole of government approach that's needed, not just in social services or community services. So I think those formal mechanisms that um, governments are fantastic about putting into place, like we had a COVID task force with over 60 different organisations represented that went through the whole of COVID, um, and apparently we're over COVID now. So, um, <laughs> you know, that task force is not as working as, 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 uh, as often as it used to, but um, nevertheless, that infrastructure is really important to get that collaboration going. Mm -hmm. So those formal mechanisms are really important, but let's not take away the idea that things are community led. So, you know, when I worked in rural Australia, we had, um, you know, uh, we covered 20,000 square kilometres in northeast Victoria and southeast New South Wales with 120 volunteers in palliative care. Now, that was community led and community developed. That might not work in Sydney. Sydney might have a completely different metro response to the way palliative care volunteers should work. And that's fine. But we need to think about those community led opportunities and how they integrate in with the state and the Commonwealth infrastructures that exist. Right. Thank you. Sorry, not a simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> The National Strategy for Volunteering highlights the fundamental importance of making volunteering more accessible and inclusive. Mo, as someone who has personal experience of navigating complex systems uh, and who interfaces with multicultural communities each and every day, 
How do you think the ecosystem can better leverage and learn from the experience and the expertise of those who do inclusion well? Yeah, great question. Um, the 2021 census uh, shows that um, more than 50% of uh, people in Australia were either born overseas or have at least one parent born overseas. It also shows us that one in four people in Australia speak a language other than English at home. We are a very diverse, proud, multicultural country. But I just feel like sometimes our systems and our programs and the policies that are um, that are done for Australia do not reflect that diversity. And I think that's the reality that we have to um, confront. Um, I think it's important for us to uh, to ensure, you know, everybody talks about diversity, how great it is and um, how wonderful it is. But I think we need to put that into practice and we need to put it into action. Um, I understand that often people are afraid of, you know, how do you navigate this? How do you start the conversation? But I think asking that question is probably the first step, uh, saying that I actually don't know how to engage with multicultural communities, but we know that they're a big part of our community that we need to tap into. Uh, I think asking that question and being humble enough to acknowledge that we don't know everything is the first step. Um, the second step, it will work itself out because there are great people, great organizations out there that will um, come and wrap around and make sure that they give you the tools and the permission to to engage in this process. I think that's the that's the biggest hurdle. Um, having a strategy is really important. Um, you know, wishful thinking isn't going to change anything, you know, to say I wish, you know, our volunteering program was as diverse as uh, what I'd like it to be. You need to put specific strategies and specific um, plans in place to ensure you recruit people from um, multicultural diverse backgrounds. Um, you know, as they say, diversity is a reality. Inclusion is a choice. And I think we need to uh, think about that. How how are we doing that within our organizations and how do we make sure that it's a positive uh, experience for people who come to volunteer? Um, this morning you might have heard about the government's uh, decision to give permanent residency to 19,000 refugees in the community. I just wanted to acknowledge <laughs> it's such wonderful news. These people have been living in the community for the past 10 years. They've been volunteering, they've been working, they're paying taxes. I have endless friends that are in the situation who wanted to be included and wanted to feel that sense of belonging because otherwise they were going mad, right? This, uh, this sense, this, uh, this sense of uh, anxiety that the government has created for these people um, without, without giving them any certainty has left them to channel that energy into something mm. good. And I think we need to acknowledge that because um, often people think that your experience from a different country does not translate to the experiences that we want here in Australia. So they're not they're left with very minimal opportunities to do, so they go volunteer. And we know endless uh, opportunities that are out there for people who've done surf life saving. And those are the wonderful stories that we just need to get get out there and celebrate. But also we need to acknowledge that it's not just those, those kind of volunteering roles that we need to, um, you know, to allow those people to, to do. <coughs> we need to open it up um, to, to make sure that these people also make make you know, they enter the workforce and make make up the, the workforce of our communities as well. Um, so I think it's it's important for us to actually address why potentially some of our organizations aren't as diverse as what we'd like to and um, make a commitment to, to change that. That's great. Thanks, Mo. And it was a great, uh, it was a great announcement this morning, one to be celebrated. Uh, it's a lot of work to be done yet. Volunteering is innovative and the ways it manifests are diverse, especially in areas like sport and recreation. Cam, reflecting on the work that the ASC has been doing to bolster participation in sport, what are your thoughts on how organisations, especially those built on institutional recruitment and management models, how can they adapt to the changing needs of volunteers? 
Uh, thanks, Mark. I think um, this room is probably no different to any other. I know it's late in the day, but uh, show of hands if you volunteer at a sports club somewhere. Um, on behalf of the Commission, thank you. Uh, <laughs> hands up if you do it in the middle of winter in Canberra. Oh. <laughs> you are the true believers. Um, uh, I think for, for us at the Sports Commission, volunteering is so core and so essential to what we do. Um, our, our data shows us that 2.9 million Australians volunteer each year. It's a huge part um, of the volunteering community. Uh, but we've t we too have suffered from COVID uh, and it really has accelerated that drop off that everyone's spoken about today in volunteering. Um, we know that there's certain structures in sport when we start to talk about institutional structures that are really hard to overcome. Um, our core roles of president, secretary, treasurer, um, our evidence shows us that it's, it's about 10 to 12 hours a week of those people's time. So if someone puts their hand up to be a, a treasurer of a sports mm. club, a secretary of a sports club, a president, 10 to 12 hours. Um, Brown was saying team managing is a very serious team. It's very similar uh, in mm. time, but hey, that's a huge commitment for someone. Yeah. That's a huge commitment for someone. So what do we, what do, we do about it? Uh, and we've been really lucky to have Mark's support and Sarah's support, who's on our sport volunteering coalition, uh, to help us navigate how to construct our own sector-wide um, strategy that nestles in underneath the national strategy. So we're really lucky that there are parallel projects. Um, our key planks um, are celebrate. So how do we celebrate volunteering, but celebrate the different ways that people volunteer? Uh, empower, so training our volunteers so they understand what they need to do, how they can do it. Um, Reimagine, so how do we shift from that old model of you know, nearly another full-time role, another part-time role into uh, micro volunteering. So what are the smaller chunks that exist across a sports club that we can shift into and change? Uh, and, and then finally, in being innovative. Um, so if you think about the Sydney, and here's a really simple example. So Sydney Olympics 2000, um, hopefully none of you still have your tracksuits. If not, <laughs> get rid of them. They're not a fashion statement anymore. But, but hundreds of thousands of Australians volunteered. You know, each weekend, there's hundreds of thousands of Australians volunteering at sports clubs, but we don't connect any of it together. So how do we find a way to take those people who are naturally giving to their community, thank them, tr train them up, and then connect them to other causes that they might be interested in? And that's some of the dialogue that we've been having um, with Mark and Sarah. A couple of things in terms of our strategy, two key things that came out of it is, yeah, we're not the experts. Um, so having our own coalition to develop our strategy and support our strategy was absolutely crucial. You know, if we just had the same people and, and sport is very male, stale and pale, um, we deliberately had a much more diverse group involved. Um, and I say that as a man who's male and, well, male, of course, but also uh, pale and stale. Um, but we need to get different people in. And, and Mo's 100% right in terms of his positioning about what the future looks like. The future of sport uh, is the immigration that's happening now. Mm. And we need to capture that as an industry, but also from a volunteering collective. And I think the final thing I'll touch on is number one thing to think about, I think, in all of our roles when it comes to volunteering is what's the volunteer experience? It's one thing to get people in for, for in our instance, into our sports clubs, but the experience has to be high quality. Otherwise, we're not going to keep them. Yep. And most importantly, they might not go on to the next volunteer activity mm. and the next volunteer experience. So uh, I think if you can do it and it works for your organisations and yourselves, we need to unify our strategies and our structures in behind the, the strategy that was launched today. If we can do that, we've got some serious horsepower in behind volunteering. Um, I always think about your own coalitions, about how you can form them within your own communities to, to learn what you don't know. Um, and then I think put that volunteer experience at the forefront. Um, and they're the things that start to break down the old traditional structures. That's great, uh, Cam. Thank you so much. It is uh, our intention. And Sarah, do we have time um, to uh, open it up to you? As I said, we have... Uh, household names of the uh, charity sector here um, and uh, we'd love the opportunity for you to be able to ask questions. 
of uh, any of the panelists. To that end, I think we yes we put up the Slido, whatever that barcode thing is. Um, <laughs> QR in code. Innovation, Mark. Innovation. <laughs> What did you say, male, pale and stale? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we, we've got, uh, do we have a roving mic, Sarah? We sure do. We have okay. a mic runner. Uh, the, the stage lights are in my eyes, so I'm not sure where they are. But we also have a microphone down here, uh, which we can run up to people, or you're welcome to come down. Or I have Slido in front of me. Um, at the moment, they're all questions from the emergency management session. If anyone wishes to comment on preparedness. Otherwise, I can, here we go, a question down the front. Could, could you repeat and the just, question? Sorry, for the recording and for everyone joining in at home, I'll just repeat the question. Uh, it was, what makes a high quality volunteering experience? Uh, I think there's probably a couple of factors. I think the first one is about, um, safety, psychological safety, but also cultural safety. Um, so, so I think so much of what happens in sport, you know, starts with that, both for our participant base, but then also for our volunteering base. Uh, and then I think more than anything, I think the volunteering experience needs to match the motivations and skills of the individual. Um, so, so I think sport, like a lot of organisations, has been guilty of saying, here's the role, let's try and find someone who can fit into there rather than saying, here's an individual in front of me who is motivated by X, Y, and Z, whose skills are A, B, C, and finding a role for them. Um, so, so I think a lot of it comes back to that matching. And then how do we recognise that person in the way that suits them? Um, so let's not get caught in the trap that everyone wants that really public recogni recognition. Everyone wants different forms of that. So I think that experience comes back to um, safety, I think matching the skills and, and the individual um, to a role, not roles to individuals, if that makes um, uh, if that makes sense to everyone, uh, and then finding the right way to reward and recognise people. Um, I think that's that, that's how I'd define a quality experience. And and also just to build on that, I think it's if you start to categorise your different volunteering uh, functions and think about what they are. So we know that younger generations prefer incident or project, I'm generalising, but research is showing younger generations prefer, prefer to be involved in an incident, one-off incident, they get engaged or projects, and then that can lead to the ongoing inclusion into a weekly or regular connection in with that program, whatever that looks like. And there's some really great examples of this. Only yesterday I was reading that with the disaster in Turkey, that people have been galvanised to go and volunteer and support the recovery process and a community recovery process, not just recovery of bodies, but community recovery, um, particularly younger people, because they've learnt during COVID, especially in Europe, that they were required to step in where, our, where seniors started to pull away from volunteering because they're worried about their own health and safety. And then, what, so what they're finding is these younger people who were engaged in that whole process of, of COVID recovery um, and stepped up are now stepping up in incident forms of, of um, so you could have a major event. You could, you know, that you say, we just want some young people to help us with this major event, whether it be a conference, a, a special event on a beach or whatever it might be. And then people will ultimately want to form that relationship. Um, so then you've also got the people who want to do the doing and they want a social connection, you know, something every week. And so having something that those people can engage in as well. So it's almost sort of starting to categorise the different types of volunteering, what it could be. And then you'll have people who just want to be experts and provide advice on how to design a new cricket pitch or design a new safety program. And they'll just want to do that as a one-off. Those volunteers could literally be worth thousands of dollars if you had to pay them, but they're volunteering their time to provide that advice. And in health, that happens all the time. There's no way we can afford to pay all the doctors and the nurses and allied health for their um, expertise all the time. But if they know they've got to work on one piece of policy or one piece of program design, um, they'll often get involved. Brianna, did you have something? The only thing I was going to add is measuring impact and sharing that with your volunteers as well. I know the one thing that inspires and motivates our volunteers more than anything else if they're picking and packing in the warehouse is knowing that at the end of their volunteering shift, 
how many meals they've created, how many families they've helped, how many lives they've changed. And they walk away knowing that they made a difference. And if you've got powerful storytelling around the people that you're helping and what you're fixing, that is immeasurable in terms of the volunteer experience. I've got some absolutely fantastic questions. Um, it's made me think we're going to have to take quite a few of these on notice because I don't want to lose them. Um, but this one I think is quite interesting um, and we've got some diverse panellists that will have a view on this, but how do we get volunteer managers in senior leadership within organisations to be contributing to strategy and decision making? Recognise that without our volunteers, we are nothing. And we say it all the time at Food Bank, if it wasn't for our volunteers, we simply couldn't do what we do. And our volunteer coordinators and managers, by and large, are part of the senior management team, are guiding strategy, are letting us know that if it wasn't for the work that they were coordinating and the impact that we're creating, we wouldn't have an organisation and we wouldn't be changing lives. So get on and do it find organisations that are doing it well and lean on your management team, your CEO, your board of directors to adopt best practice and recognise that it is. It comes back to the strategic planning process. If your strategic planning process for your organisation embraces volunteering as an integral part of your operations or your service delivery, then part of that SWOT analysis that you do when you're developing a strategic plan will be consulting with your volunteers, consulting with your clients, consulting with people and saying, what do you think is important? And volunteering should be part of that SWOT analysis. And therefore, once you have your strategic plan, like Cam was saying, that talks about where volunteers might sit into the future of that organisation, then your annual operating plan or your business plan should incorporate that role of volunteer management or volunteer coordination as an integral part of your operations. Yeah, I think my only other extension on that is um, being aware of the key things at an exact level, what pe the people um, sort of attuned to, and I know it comes up in the volunteer strategies around the value of volunteering, um, both from a personal perspective, but importantly, a financial perspective. So. You know, we know that volunteers contribute $4 billion to the sport and recreation sector when we consider the time spent that people, the, 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 the time that people spent. Now that is an incredible number that no corporate sponsorship can ever fill. Um, so when you start to talk about the business case for volunteering, you know, understanding that for your organisations, being really clear in the business case about why um, volunteering should have a strong voice in your strategic process. It's a bit of a no-brainer when you start to put it in the terms that a lot of our C-suite people are used to. Here's the business case, here's the return on our investment, um, and hopefully uh, it stacks up. And you're obviously all leaders who are, who are walking the talk, but during the discovery process, we heard from lots of volunteer managers and leaders that the profession is invisible. How do we get other leaders to recognise internally their managers and coordinators of volunteers and elevate that position? Because a lot of a lot of us do need to look internally and figure out how we can make sure that we are strategically investing in that function. Any thoughts? I'll, I'll, I'll share. Um, I'll share from our experience during COVID. Um, Camilla started this, so <laughs> uh, look. I think for us, I think there's been a um, a decade or longer uh, of underinvestment in community development. Um, and when COVID hit, obviously, you know, the government kind of just, you know, scrambled to try and get the messages out to, to the community. How do you communicate um, with people who don't speak English and you haven't actually properly engaged with them in the past? It's not a flick of a switch. You mm -hmm. can't just expect them to just get the message. I mean, you need to understand the complexities. A lot of them came here as refugees and they have, um, you know, trust issues with governments. Because of that lack of, uh, you know, building trust that you need, that takes time, um, we actually couldn't deliver that message ourselves. Like we realized that no matter, no matter how much money you throw at this, you will not be able to achieve the outcome that you want. So that's where volunteers came in. This is where we, we said, uh, you know, you're the community, you know what uh, the issue is at a very grassroots level. You tell us what you need, we'll give you the tools and we'll support you and you go and do it because you know your community, you know what works and you are the trusted person in the community. So that we adopted that model and that kind of took off 
And, you know, the, the results were amazing because, you know, like we just kind of supported them. And that was a bit of a light bulb moment that, you know, for me anyway, and for governments, I think, hopefully, that you can't just throw money at things and expect them to work without genuine community development on the ground. That needs to be sustained for the long haul. Now, once we did that first tranche, we started seeing that people wanted to do more. They came back and said, this was amazing. Like, I felt like there was a sense of purpose. I achieved something. I protected my community and I want to do more. Here is my second project. Thanks, Mo. And I'm mindful of time, which means all of these phenomenal questions that are coming through, I promise you we will not lose them. I wish we could keep asking them. The last one I'm going to ask, which is specifically directed at Cam, because I will 100% of the time support someone shooting their shot. Cam, you mentioned the 2000 Olympics. It's my dream to manage volunteers at the 2032 Olympic <laughs> Games. Are you the right person to talk to? Oh, no. <laughs> That's Unfortunately, I'm not. <laughs> he um, might know who is though. So whoever put that can, question in. Actually, I can introduce you to the right people. So come and see me later. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, I can see Matt Carr from the Australian Sports Commission who was on our strategy council sitting up there as well. So I'm sure we'll find him over the next couple of days. Um, but that's all we have time for this afternoon. Please join me in a round of applause for our wonderful panel. Thank you. I'm going to keep you for just a couple of minutes of housekeeping and then I will release you. I had in my notes uh, an encouragement for anyone who was interested to do a walk around our piece de resistance, Lake Belly Griffin. I don't think the weather has particularly turned up for that to be an enjoyable activity, uh, but if you would like to, you can walk to Lake Belly Griffin from here and it takes about an hour. Our welcome reception will be held at the QT Hotel where you all had lunch from seven o'clock. A very casual come along network, have drinks uh, and canapes or horses duvres, as my dad would say, uh, and get to know one another a bit better. We'll all be there, the Volunteering Australia team. Um, and for anyone who has luggage tomorrow, you're very welcome to bring it with you. Uh, and in the exhibition hall, we'll check it in for you and check it out at the end of the day. So don't worry about having to check out of your hotels and having a suitcase. Uh, and whilst this service is complimentary, um, Canberra's outgrown its reputation for being the home of pyrotechnics, but if anyone has procured illegal fireworks, please dispose of them before handing them to our wonderful luggage team. Uh, enjoy your afternoon. You have about 90 minutes of it until the welcome reception. There's lots to see and do in Canberra. If you need any tips, come and find one of us, and we look forward to seeing you either tonight or back here at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs>